So I'd like to thank Charles and the, and the Seattle um, Science Foundation for the invitation and, and for putting on such a great show so far. It's been a really nice way to spend a Friday um, afternoon and morning up here in uh, the Northeast. So yeah, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our work. My lab really looks at, at therapeutics for glioblastoma in, in various various ways. And, and we were interested in um, this, this uh, discovery that cytomegalovirus may have a a modulatory role or an influence on, on the way that tumors grow because there are many uh, many um, therapeutic inspirations that we can that we can gain from that and this uh, little cartoon of the virus on the on the side of the screen here shows some of the roles that we're investigating for CMV in in the context of, gli of glioblastoma so we we we'll, I'll show you some evidence that uh, the presence of cytomegalovirus may influence tumor progression um, there is evidence from other labs that shows that encephalopathy as a result of viral reactivation during treatment may affect some patients. Um, there is not really any strong evidence for causation at this point, but it's a, and I won't be discussing that, although it is always a question that comes up. And there's also evidence that CMV promotes uh, resistance to conventional therapies. So this all goes back actually to a, a, an experiment that Charles Cobbs did as a as a, as a younger man uh, that was published in 2002. And Charles was looking at looking around for um, associations of, of CMV with, um, with uh, viruses with glioblastoma and did some Im immunostaining of cytomegalovirus in a, in, in a panel of glioblastomas. And his staining approach showed that there was a, a signal in, in all of the glioblastomas that he, uh, that he examined um, uh, where there was nothing in normal brain. And this, this discovery sparked a whole um, a whole series of, of further investigations, functional investigations of CMV in glioblastoma stem cells, CMV gene associations, so overexpression of CMV genes, et cetera, in, uh, in, uh, in glioblastoma that provided some support to the, to, the, to, the, to the original idea that CMV may play a role in, um, in glioblastoma. And he also, um, and it also inspired some clinical trials using immunotherapies and antiviral therapies against glioblastoma. However, this, uh, th this initial spurt of work spurred a bit of a backlash. So, so uh, uh, several years ago, almost 10 years ago now, there were a series of papers that came out in, um, in neuro-oncology and in New England Journal, um, promoting the idea that, initially promoting the idea that CMV may be important in glioblastoma clinically. However, there was a kind of backlash against this and, and, and some criticisms of those original experiments from, from uh, some groups, as you can see, here um, that, that really questioned that. So, uh, and there were also some uh, some additional studies that showed that CMV, at least by conventional staining methods, so so conventional immunostaining and in situ hybridization, were not able to detect CMV. So I I wandered into this minefield of controversy, actually, and also no one could detect CMV transcripts in TCGA data. So uh, there's still some question, some some outstanding questions that we're trying to address in the lab. But I wandered into this controversy. Um, thinking it was a very interesting idea. And so my lab originally did some staining for, 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 for CMV and glioblastoma, and we were able to recapitulate to some degree Charles's original results. Here we see some positive staining for a CMV protein called IE1 in a human glioblastoma specimen. And we also did some nice immunofluorescence studies for CMV PP65, which is the major immunodominant antigen in human glioblastoma. So my, uh, I, have a, I, have a, <laughs> I have an old... Um, an old laser pointer that's actually going at the, at the same time. So I apologize for that. We saw some PP65 um, immunostaining and some CD31 immuno, and, and it, co it overlapped with blood vessels essentially, but very specifically with, uh, with pericytes um, stained here by NG2. As you can see, there's a very great merge between the two. We'd, we've done some PCR studies and these are ongoing uh, using, using uh, optimized primers against CMV Protein, uh, CMV genes uh, in glioblastoma specimens, we can see a small but significant uh, uh, amount of CMV IE1 in our specimens that we've looked at so far. And also we've developed a mouse model in which we can see intratumoral expression of CMV, uh, CMV genes. Um, just to quickly uh, introduce CMV, if we don't know, it's a very, very common virus in, in humans, about between 50% or 100% of, of people are infected. It's a herpes virus. It's a lifelong infection after, you, after you're infected. It's a complicated virus with 235 at least genes, uh, sorry, 165 genes and many more open reading frames. 
and 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 it persists lifelong. And as you age and your immune system declines, CMV can 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 creep out with increasing frequency and actually skews your 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 uh, circulating T cells to be uh, largely uh, many many uh, high proportion sorry of the T cells that you circulate actually recognize CMV uh, with aging in infected individuals. And, and because it's conserved across mammalian species, it gives us a chance to actually ask questions in mouse models. And that's what I'm going to really talk about in a couple of minutes. But a couple of really important pieces of, of evidence uh, supporting uh, CMV, or at least supporting our investigation of CMV. Uh, this paper from 2020 that came from Cecilia soderberg Nockler's lab in Sweden, which shows that um, in their cohort of patients, of, 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 it's a large cohort of patients that they've been treating with valgancyclovir, which is an antiviral drug that stops CMV replication. And this, uh, uh, when combined with, with, uh, with standard of care in primary glioblastoma patients in the Carroll Institute, Institute, they were able to show a median survival of about 24 months, uh, which is obviously a very significant increase compared with historical controls. Um, and this came out in 2020, and there's a phase three trial going on now. There are a bunch of uh, other Trials um, are using CMV targeted immunotherapies such as pulse DCs or, or uh, anti CMV T cells isolated from patients and expanded ex vivo. And, and those trials have shown a series of encouraging results, although they're, they're relatively small trials that have been published so far. This is an interesting set of studies as well, supporting a potential uh, reason to think about CMV in glioblastoma. This is from a uh, a group in Germany who have monitored CMV reactivation during therapy in their cohort of patients. And they were able to see uh, the appearance of CMV infection in a subset of their patients by uh, measuring uh, CMV genomes and by measuring IgM in the, uh, in the serum. And they could detect that, that in, a, in a small subset of patients, about 20% actually, in their, in their group that CMV, CMV could reactivate and that those patients actually did remarkably poorly and they thought that that was due to HCMV uh, associated encephalopathy. And over here in this figure, we have, um, we have some potential reasons for that. So, so we have already an immunosuppressed tumor. We have a virus that's constantly trying to get out of its uh, latent state. It actually resides quite commonly in monocytes, which are recruited to glioblastoma. And so theoretically, we could imagine a scenario in which those CMV latent monocytes could ultimately react CMV, uh, reactivate CMV particularly under these immunosuppressive conditions, including chemotherapy, irradiation, steroids, as well as the, um, the, the natural immunosuppressive qualities of the tumor. And, um, and, and actually they gave these patients uh, valgancyclovir and were able to get the patients that reactivated CMV through this particular stage, which was early in therapy. I think this is a very interesting paper and, and worth consideration. So we set up a mouse model in, in my lab, there was a previous study actually done by Rick Price and Nino Kiyoka, um, uh, but when, when we were back at Ohio State historically, and they used a genetic model. And I re-established that model when I was at Brigham and Women's using a GL261, which is a sort of standard um, immunogenic, um, syngenic, uh, implantable mouse model of glioblastoma. And what we, what we did here was we, we infected pups at P2 with, a, with, with murine cytomegalovirus. And we allowed that virus, it go, undergoes a period of acute infection and then slowly uh, slowly becomes latent. And after, and after week 14 to 15, the virus is no longer detectable. And we implant the tumors there. And obviously we can see this uh, in green, the, um, the, the CMV positive animals actually do significantly worse than their control CMV negative animals. And by MRI, we can see the tumors are larger. By histology, we can see that the, uh, that the tumors are also very bloody and invasive, and we can also see that there's a, a, a much enhanced weight loss in these tumors and different histology. Um, just going back to a, another study by Charles, this is an important experiment where Charles took his, his, uh, his human patients and looked at the C serum CMV IgG in those patients. And in the positive patients, we can see here the overall survival is significantly less, again, supporting this idea that CMV may be promoting uh, tumor progression. We also have shown in some unpublished work that when we treat um, CMV infected cells or glioblastoma cells in vitro, um, they do not respond to TMZ. So this is in the in the green here. We're no longer able to, to, kill, to, to kill those cells with temozolomide. And we actually show a down regulation 
Oh, sorry, an upregulation of MGMT in the presence of CMB infection. And we think this is driven by an NF kappa B responsive element in the MGMT promoter, because when we knock down um, uh, the NF kappa B, uh, NF kappa B rel A, which is actually confusingly P65, but this is NF kappa B, um, we can actually block that induction of MGMT in those cells. And we, when we treat the mouse, the mice um, infected with CMB in green here. With temozolomide, we do not see an, inf uh, an increase in survival, whereas we do in our uh, in our controls. So there could be multiple reasons why CMB positive patients actually do a little bit worse. Here's some data from our mouse mouse model where we we asked the question of whether um whether a, a, an antiviral drug might have an effect on on survival, an impact on survival in these in these mice. So we treat them with an antiviral drug called sidofovir. Um, uh, during the during the during the tumor tumor growth stages, and we were able again to shift the survival of these of these mice to to almost in the same area as the as the control animals, whereas the control animals didn't respond to this antiviral drug at all. And uh, this 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 shows some of the changes that we see when we treat animals with sidofovir. So the MCMV positive animals have a abundant um, angiogenesis. This is reversed by antiviral drug treatment. They also express a protein called PDGFD, which I think drives some of these effects um, that we see. And again, that's reversed in the presence of an antiviral drug. And also some of the blood vessel phenotypes, which I haven't had time to really describe in great detail, but pericyte association with blood vessels, which we see very clearly in our, in our, in our mouse model, are reversed again by the antiviral drug. So we, in, in some more recent work, we've, we've gone on to, to extend our studies into multiple mouse models. So here we have four different syngenic uh, uh, mouse models, with syngenic with black six mice. They're all genetically distinct and come from various different um, uh, uh, backgrounds. And what we see in each case is that the tumors, the tumors grow faster, the animal survival is shorter, and, the, and, and we've seen that, and we can see the tumor volume here is increased in each case. So this is a robust effect across multiple mouse models. When we try to um, investigate the presence of CMV in these tumors, we can see here that there's an association of two CMV, two murine CMV antigens with endothelial cells in the, in the mouse model. This contrasts with what we see in the humans, which is pericytes, but this can be actually accounted for by species specific differences between the human CMV and mouse CMV that we see. So we do see CMV in the tumor microenvironment. We also have a very, the most robust phenotype we see in this model is that there's an increased angiogenesis. And across all four of these models in the naive state, we can see there's, there are blood vessels detectable using CD31 staining, but that these blood vessels are much more abundant and much, much, you know, much more mature in their, in their look in general compared with the controls in the CMV positive animals. So we have a, a CMV driven increase in angiogenesis across the board. We also looked here at some um, some um, other markers. So, so on the left, the control animals. This is a GL261 tumor. There's not much going on in terms of inside the tumor, in terms of uh, macrophage or microglia infiltrates. And there's a very very nicely defined border between those between the tumor and the normal brain. In the in the con in, in great contrast, there's a very mixed border. Uh, invasion, um, reactive astrocytes in the CMB model, and also there's the presence of IBA1 positive cells, which uh, which are the macrophages or microglia inside the CMB infected tumor. And we went on to look a little bit more in a bit more detail at the immune microenvironment using um, using using a combination of flow cytometry and cytoff analysis. And kind of the take home message from this, this is work that we that we recently submitted for publication. There's an increase in CD4 and CD8 cells in the CMV model. Uh, there are some increases in macrophages and dendritic cells as well. And we also, and, um, and in, the, in the CD8 T cell population, about 15% of them actually recognize CMV using tetramer assays. So we get an, an influx of virus recognizing CMV positive, CMV recognizing T cells in our model. And these T cells overall um, express some of the exhaustion markers uh, associated with an immune response. So there's a more, these, these tumors definitely show a more inflammatory phenotype than, the, uh, than, their, than their naive controls. And uh, in the corner here, we can see some staining for IDO1, another interferon induced gene involved in immunosuppression, in immunosuppression that's highly expressed in our uh, CMV model compared with uh, the naive mice. And just to talk to you, just to really close out here with 
a proposed mechanism that we have is that in your CMV positive host, which could be a mouse or a human, and this is using evidence mostly from mice, in the immunosuppressive environment, which is also driven by immunosuppressive therapies, we can imagine a situation in which CMV could reactivate in the tumor microenvironment. We also think CMV actually sculpts the systemic immune system, which could also have effects on the on tumor growth. Anyway, the reactivation in the TMV in the tumor microenvironment we propose activates various transcription factors, including NF kappa B and STAT3, driving the expression of a number of different cytokines, including PDGFD, which we actually have some evidence is very important in this process. This leads to parasite recruitment, angiogenesis and improved blood flow leading to increased growth. But then also that growth could lead to further CMV reactivation resulting in a kind of feed forward cycle, we think. There are various uh, points at which we can potentially hit this therapeutically. So immunotherapies directed against cytomegalovirus could be, could be useful in terms, of, um, in terms of targeting those CMV infected cells. Um, there's also a, an anti-PDGFD approach that, we, that we're looking at right now using small molecules and blocking antibodies. And also the antiviral approach, which has been, which is now in a phase three trial, and which we're trying to understand using some of our mouse models as we, as we speak, actually. So just to really summarize what I've said, in, in patient GBM, there's, there's evidence for shorter survival in CMV seropositive patients. There is evidence also for a response to antiviral drugs, and there's evidence, clinical evidence of viral reactivation induced by therapy in a subset of patients. In our murine model, what we see is faster tumor growth in agreement potentially with what we see in humans. This can be reversed by an antiviral drug. In this case, we've used sidofovir, but we're investigating other ones as we speak. We see this angiogenic and pro-inflammatory tumor microenvironment. We, show, we also have some evidence that's not in this talk and is under review right now that this is independent of infection age. So we can infect adults, we can infect um, young animals, and we seem to have the same phenotype. We also, when we use a, uh, a, a, a virus that's defective in replication, um, we, we do not, we do not um, replicate our phenotype. So we believe that this uh, phenotype that we see is actually dependent on viral replication. We're trying to work on detection, clearer detection methods, and we're trying to model further clinical scenarios in our, in our mouse model and identify new targets, which actually this model has enabled us to do. And I'd like to thank everybody involved, including Charles, who, is, who remains the inspiration in this field, and also my, my, uh, my former chairman, Nino Kiyoka, who really helped initiate this, Charles Cook, who is our collaborating a CMV expert, and my two hardworking postdocs who drove all the work that I've presented today. And thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. Sean, what a great talk. Um, obviously, it uh, hits home for me because I'm very interested in this area. I have two questions. Um, number one, when you try to PCR the virus out of the tumors in the mice, do you find that it's easily detectable, robust by you know viral DNA in the tumors? Or is it more like in the human tumors where it's kind of hard? Yeah, we find that it's a little easier to detect in the mouse than the human. Um, I don't know exactly why, but um, yeah. My second question is, um, I think the take home point was when there's increased uh, infiltration of monocytes and T cells, they come in, but they are, um, they are uh, in, in, exhausted and are non-functional. So they're, they're coming in, you have increased maybe myeloid suppressor T cells and their um, mononuclear cells coming in, but they may have the M2 pro um, tumor phenotype instead of the anti-tumor phenotype. Is that kind of what you're seeing? Yeah, I would, I would say that that is broadly the case. I, th I think that there's, um, there's a drive to increase the immunosuppression in the, yeah. in the, in the model. Fascinating, uh, and we'll see where this story leads. I, I think if I had a GBM, I actually would still take antiviral, <laughs> but I'm not supposed to editorialize. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, thank you, Charles, and thanks for thanks for leading leading us in this direction. It's been very interesting, and hopefully, it'll be fruitful. A controversial road, but we'll see what happens in the <laughs> long run. Um, I think, uh, Michael, I see you there. I think I'm going to take a 10 minute break. So.